Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Hundreds of people protested against police brutality in several cities around the country yesterday. Twelve people were arrested on New York's Brooklyn Bridge when they marched alongside about 250 others. In Madison, Wisconsin, about 100 people blocked a major road. In Oakland, hundreds of people marched outside a police department and along a freeway. In San Francisco, about 100 people circled a police station and went on to speak out at a city council meeting. Activists also briefly blocked the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Oakland. In Los Angeles, where it appears the largest number of people were arrested, about 100 people blocked metro rail tracks Officers took 15 people into custody. Many of those who marched in various cities were young, some even high school students. And separately, a group called the Justice League NYC is leading a march of activists from New York to Washington, D.C.'s National Mall. Well, Courtney, these protests have gotten very little media coverage. I mean, there's been local coverage, but outside of Reuters, almost no national coverage. Even Venezuela's Telesur network covered the protests. Uh, imagine if these were right-wing protesters. I mean, I definitely think that the relative lack of coverage is pretty shocking. And, you know, I was reading the New York Times this morning and I had to literally search uh, for the story about the protests on the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was uh, buried in the New York City section of four headlines down. Um, and considering that all these protests were taking place in other parts of the country, clearly it wasn't just a city issue. Um, it is an, it's a matter of national politics. And so, you know, I think that what this shows us, you know, what this reminds us is that, um, you know, the major mainstream media networks, unlike Uprising, um, are, are corporate entities, and they're run by, uh, by uh, folks who have largely conservative political interests. And so since the right has really been unable to shut the protests down or to discredit them, I think one of the strategies that we're seeing emerging is to, uh, is to diminish the importance and the impact of these, of these protests by simply not covering them or covering them inaccurately. Um, and, you know, and we've seen this before. And so, you know, what I think is encouraging in all of this, though, is that uh, these are young protesters who are very media savvy and they're taking advantage of all of the new social media tools that they have available, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, to create their own narratives, uh, uh, their own media stories about what's happening uh, and keeping that story alive and forcing the mainstream media to, ha to engage with them. Right. And elsewhere in the U.S., another protest with scant U.S. media coverage is taking place, this time behind bars in South Texas. Migrant mothers from Mexico and Central America being held at privately run detention centers in squalid conditions are on hunger strike. The euphemistically named Carnes Family Residential Center houses more than 500 undocumented immigrants. Among the allegations of abuse are sexual assault and inadequate and poor quality food. Children are being held with their mothers, at least some of whom have already passed their credible fear interviews to qualify for asylum. The Guardian reported that one mother was held in solitary confinement with her two-year-old child. As part of their protest of these terrible conditions, many mothers are refusing meals and other services until their concerns are addressed. Well, Courtney, how much of a measure of American barbarism is this story? I mean, the criminalization of undocumented immigrants in this country and, and the way that they're treated by our criminal justice system is really, I, I mean, I think it, uh, it, it calls into question all of the democratic values that we claim to hold sacred here. I mean, the family detention centers are especially awful. Um, you know, we know that uh, mothers and children are kept in inhumane conditions. They're denied due process of law. Uh, and their human rights can be and often are violated with impunity. And, and I think that what we're seeing happen here uh, is even more distressing when we consider the fact that most of these people are coming precisely because they're seeking asylum and relief from unlivable conditions in their home countries, many of which have been exacerbated by U.S. foreign policy. And they come to the U.S. looking for relief, and instead we incarcerate them. And so I think this is shameful, and history will not be kind to us. Um, you know, when, it, when, when we are evaluated for the way that we allowed undocumented immigrants to be treated at this moment. And history is likely not going to be kind to Europe as well. Hundreds of migrants attempting to enter Europe by boat have lost their lives. And what has become a depressingly familiar story of the more than 500 people who were on board a ship that left Libya heading for Italy earlier this week, only 144 survivors remain. Separately, over the weekend, Italian authorities rescued 8,500 migrants, but they were the lucky ones. In 2014, more than 3,000 migrants died at sea, and according to the International Organization for Migration, there have been an estimated 22,000 migrant deaths at sea since 2000. A record number of people are expected to try to cross into the European Union this year alone. 
Most of them come from countries ravaged by poverty and war, such as Libya, Syria, Eritrea, and Somalia. At one time, Italy had launched a dedicated program for migrants called Mare Nostrum, but then abandoned it after a year, even though it saved over 100,000 lives. Courtney, are people making enough connections with the policies being pushed by Western governments that drive people to leave their homes in the first place? Uh, you know, well, there are always people, I think, who can connect the dots and see the bigger picture. But, you know, on the whole, I think that what we see uh, in mainstream media coverage of these events is a tendency to treat them as isolated or separate incidents and not to really analyze the larger forces that produce these kinds of tragedies. I mean, when war and militarism uh, and economic crisis make people's home countries unlivable, uh, they are pushed into making the kinds of risky decisions that uh, that can result in, in what we saw happen uh, this week. And, you know, and I think that, um, you know, you think about a Libyan citizen, what must he or she think when, when he or she looks around and sees the country descending into civil war and chaos? Uh, you know, they must think to themselves, I have nothing to lose. And yeah. so I think, again, like the women who are in uh, detention centers in South Texas, these are people who are really the victims of, you know, sort of the hangover, the afterlife of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are political refugees, and we should treat them as such. Courtney, thanks, as always, for joining us. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Mars is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.